art at school is where my real life properly began that's where I found my my true calling sketchbooks were like the, the one thing that I just like kept on going at then got more into portraits and then moved myself into digital it was a bit of a battle there as well you know basically tell your parents no I want to be an artist I want to take a screenshot of someone's life and turn it into a story I pride myself on depth and detail and more color vibrancy because that's what immerses people into the artwork. When it came to certain pieces that were a bit more controversial, I'm trying to empower people, even through showing the reality, the rawness of their, their lives and the situations that they go through. My, my focus and research of doing Maharani's, I was mainly looking at Mughal art, but I thought let's bring this into a new age and change people's perception. Things can get construed into it and twisted, but if anything, I'm getting people talking about it. NFT stands for non-fungible token. That would be game changer because this is where AI and VR is going in that direction where you can Welcome back to the Culturecast podcast. My guest today is an artist who specializes in digital illustrations. Welcome Vic Gaint. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. I'm good. Um, the way I like to start each and every podcast before we dive into art and digital art is a trip down memory lane. Basically, tell me about your upbringing. Tell me what baby Vic was like. Tell me about your cultural upbringing. All of that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Oh, my God. Uh, I have to go back quite a bit because I'm, I'm getting on now. But um, <laughs> the big three zeros um, looming. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's coming, man. Um, so I was born on Halloween, so that that's that that's that's the birth date, man. Like you know, I've I've heard all the all the ugly jokes that come with that, you know, every birthday. But um, yeah, I I, I guess uh, back in the day, I was um, always quite quite a chubby kid with uh, with braces, glasses, you know, the 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 typical dork at school. But um, I think at school as well, it was always um, you know art that kind of like um, art class that I loved, you know. Um, that was the one place where I was always um, just letting my creativity flow and just, you know, get myself, you know, um, in, in, the, in the mood of making something new. And I was just like, I guess I'm, I'm jumping some years because I guess art is where I feel like art at school is where my, my real life properly began because that's where I found my, my true calling, you know, um, but yeah, so I mean, it's it's always been when I since I was about twelve years old, I was drawing cars. I was um, you know always watching so so much of The Simpsons that I I knew how to draw them. Mm -hmm. It was weird. Still can't draw Maggie and Maggie and Lisa. Their their hair is difficult, but I can <laughs> do the rest. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, fr from that I just um, I had tons of sketchbooks sketchbooks were like the, the one thing that I just like kept on going at you know completing as many as I could and just um, observation drawings and stuff like that I, I really enjoyed that kind of stuff and um, then got more into portraits and then moved myself into digital into the digital world just because I love computers at the time and um, you know th there were certain free softwares that were available um, and just um, playing around with them and you know experimenting and I think I still experiment today um mm -hmm. from that uh you know from then moving on to uni and uni was where I decided you know I want to I want to pursue art as a career you know um I couldn't do a nine to five job because I did that I I I worked at, at um at Primark in the women's shoes shoes <laughs> you know department and yeah. um I worked in curry selling tvs like the typical Indian guy but that wasn't me man you know I think um I could sell, but I wasn't enjoying it. Um, and so I felt like as I, um, you know, got out of uni, I was like, I'm never going to go back into a nine to five job again. And um, I just want to do my own thing and feel like I have freedom in what I do. Yeah, no, I, I completely understand that. I think a lot of people need to uh, experience what they don't want to do to find out what they do want to do. And I think that's obviously Primark and Curry's, no disrespect to them. But I think a lot of people do have to experience them side of sort of jobs to to find out what their real passion is or like pursue hobbies on the outside of that and and get get that like going full time um, oh, yeah. but we've just basically skipped like 20 25 years in that like two minute period so yeah let's let's unpack that a bit let's unpack that a bit because otherwise this podcast is gonna be like two minutes long <laughs> <laughs> uh, so 
going back just before you got into art which from the sounds of it was that early teenage years when you when yeah. uh because uh, like yourself I, I obviously have glasses on now but i had braces as a kid and i was very fat uh as, as <laughs> i've said on the podcast before when speaking to a lot of fitness people so mm-hmm. um i can i can relate on that side of things but outside of school what was home life like what was uh the cultural side of things like um hindu punjabi i believe yeah that's correct yeah. so did that play a part in your um like to, to gravitate towards art because as i've said to like uh, previous artists that i've had on the show is um i think that our our rich history is very artistic and very bright colorful we have a lot of paintings and things when you go back to india in mandas and godwaras and things like this mm. so do you think that um what was home life like and how did that sort of fit into this i guess home life was pretty normal and i guess normal being like you know um waking up eating dinner at a certain time you know going to school getting ready um all that kind of stuff was pretty normal however i was evidently not the same as my sister i have an older sister but Mm. she was always into maths economics you know um she was she was she was the, the, the 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 smart one and i'm the i'm the creative one that you know i guess my parents never knew how to really support what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was, it was like culture was there. We, we always went Godwara. We always went Mandir as well um, because in the Punjabi, I guess when I was younger, I was like confused. What am I, you know, mm-hmm. we're not exactly Sikh, but our, our culture is Punjab, like Punjab and Punjabi, but we go to Mandir. And we go to Gurdwara as well. But I feel like I'm more in touch with my Punjabi side as I grew up. Mm. uh, Because we always listened to like Bhangra. Um, My dad always taught us about, um, I guess, other bands like Queen and, you know, the Bee Gees, etc. You know, Michael Jackson. And so it was always like, um, you know, going over to Cousin's house and everything like that, you know, and just chilling out. But um, that's what I feel like before the age of 10 and 12, before I started learning doll or I started, you know, getting into art, everything was pretty like standard, you know, I never kind of knew exactly where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. I guess you always have, you know, um, the thought of, oh, I want to be a race car driver or, you know, um, build a rocket and whatever, you know, it's, it's these little dreams, but those little dreams can become, you know, something in the future. If you, you never know, you know, what could happen. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I used to take like music classes, you know, learning piano, um, learning guitar. Didn't enjoy that. I quite enjoyed guitar, to be honest. Went to I'm Punjabi really school good. and got kicked out of Punjabi school because I was that bad. <laughs> the naughty kid in class. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that that was a that was a part of it though, isn't it? Like, uh, and even now, I guess I'm I'm speaking more Punjabi. Just generally, I can understand it and you know, realize now when I, when I watch back at like uh, videos of when me and my sister were younger, we used to speak so much Punjabi at home. And I was like, how did we forget this? Like mm-hmm. we, we fell out of speaking it so naturally at home that it was like bizarre to watch us as youngers just, you know, speaking it so, so normally and naturally. But I think that was because me and my sister always used to sit with my mom and watch Hindi movies or Punjabi movies or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so naturally that's what we kind of, you know, um, just spoke at home. But um, as we grew up, we kind of just lost that a little bit, which was a bit unfortunate, I guess. Um, but now it's like, I just mix it in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's a, there's quite a few people like that, like my friends included, myself a bit included, where when I was like really small, I would be speaking Punjabi, obviously you have grandparents around, you have your family around. And then I think when you get into school and things, like sometimes you can feel isolated, if that makes yeah. sense, especially like, because I'm from Newcastle, so it's a bit uh, different from perhaps down south, where it's possibly a bit more diverse. But um, you feel a bit more isolated, you want to you wanna integrate a bit more and then you sort of lose touch with one side to assimilate to the other and then you grow up and try to grab that side back and it's like a, it's like sure. a balancing act of just going from one, one side to the other. Do you you know, find- it's, weird. It's, it's weird sometimes when I was at school, it's kind of like a lot of us Asians felt like we didn't know whether we were good people or not because there was a lot of racism. Mm-hmm. Just naturally there was a lot of racism and it was like, 
we're getting put down and yet we're like how do we do we do something about it you know but we're we're in this school confined space that you know if we do something we don't know what the consequences are mm-hmm. and being young it's kind of like having to just mentally battle that at the same time and you know uphold ourselves yet nowadays i feel like you know if i if i knew people from school you know they'd big me up because of my following but you know back then it was just like oh uh, indian boy blah 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 you know racial slurs and all that kind of stuff that naturally happened but i think that was that's just a part of growing up as well which was pretty sad yeah i've i've had this conversation with quite a few people um or on this podcast and, and obviously out of it as well but it's it's that argument some people have the argument of kids will be kids so whatever you'll get bullied for you'll get bullied for whether we're being like us uh, overweight or have braces or you, yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. you get train tracks or Trump, like fatty or whatever um, and then because we're obviously brown so we're different then they attack that side of things yeah. um, which I can understand with kids being kids and things but then at the same time it's like kids aren't taught like kids don't know racism growing up like they're taught it from somewhere so there has to be some sort of malicious intent do you yeah. know what I mean? Like from either if they've heard their dad call the guy at the corner shop a pucky, yeah. then they might re- regurgitate it to us because he said it in an angry tone to someone's brown. And we think it's okay. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's um it's a really interesting one. Uh, the the way that I've sort of come to summarize it, I think in my mind is I, I don't think it'll ever stop the racism. Bullying definitely won't ever stop, but racism, I don't think it'll ever stop. I think it's becoming less popular though. Sure. especially with the rise of social media. Like if you get caught on a video uh, saying a racial slur, it has financial consequences now. Like you lose your job, you lose X, Y, and Z. So hopefully it becomes uh, eradicated in that sense. But I don't think you can ever get that tribalism out of people's heads. Yeah, yeah. It's something that will continue and it's, and it's difficult to get out of it. But I feel like my, myself as an artist, I think I've done a lot of artworks that have been controversial enough to, to challenge those ideas to people as well. Mm-hmm. You know, just to ask the question of what if and that you can't stop like Muslims and Hindus and Punjabis being friends at school, growing up together, yeah. white people and, and you know, black people and, and Asian people being friends together. Like a lot of the time at home, you know, families might tell each other you can't be friends with these kids at, at, at school, you know, because they're bad people, but you can't stop it from happening. And so, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and it becomes time. a meme sometimes. I remember, like, do you remember that 8K scene of like, that yeah, sort of, yeah, it yeah, becomes yeah, a yeah. meme, but like, yeah. there's sort of, there is that under, un, like, it, it has meaning behind it, dude. I mean, it is actually what uh, it is reality. And it's yeah. sort of the, the thing with this podcast is like, I've obviously had predominantly Yapane on, but other cultures as well. And when you realize that most people who are first generation, second generation immigrants or a uh, uh, from a ethnic origin that they're not living in the same country as their ethnic origin most of the upbringings are the same they have the strict parents they're told to do traditional jobs like yeah. for example your sister um and then there will be some outliers <laughs> exactly. become a doctor yeah <laughs> exactly doctor lawyer engineers the stereotype mm. um so because they don't the parents don't want to have that insecurity they want to have security for the children so yeah. when you when you boil it down most people are the same but then you just have these little divisions that are created by well us really yeah yeah but going so going on to art because i feel like that was really deep really quickly <laughs> so going on to art you, you're a kid at school you're finding that your art classes are the the ones that you're enjoying the most and um I know obviously you're a big uh, motorhead. You, you recently yeah. came off a road trip to Wales and things <laughs> going through. So was that, have you always been a motorhead? Was that the inspiration at first, drawing, drawing uh, cars? Yeah, I think so. I was always like, hey, I want to design the next big, you know, car, to, you know, and um, hopefully get it made and whatever. But obviously when I was that young, I was like, I never knew the process of making a car or designing a car. You know, <laughs> it was just something I learned myself or just wanted to draw because I, because I had like a, you know um just an interest in it um so yeah but when when being at school it was always like just doodles in in all my workbooks you know and it just became like to a point where other people were like hey can you draw in mine can you draw in mine da, 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 da. and I'm like yeah sure why not <laughs> 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 you know um but 
I could just now now I'm thinking I just left my mark on like everyone's um you know workbooks and they all just have these drawings and doodles and stuff. Um, that could be worth probably, a pretty penny now. <laughs> yeah, um, but but things I don't know if they still exist right now. You know, like oh, yeah. that was such a long time ago. People just throw away their their books and stuff afterwards, don't they? So um, yeah, I mean like. Uh, art class was always the one that I that I stayed in longer after school you know mm -hmm. every you know every Monday every every Wednesday it was always like no nah, I want to stay longer and you know just be creative and not go home <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. um because I think around that time it was it was very much like my parents could see that I was getting more into my you know art class and stuff and that they didn't know how to support that as such and encourage that mm -hmm. so when it came to like results days such as you know um like GCSEs and you know etc art was always the one that I got an A in but everything else was like B's and C's mm -hmm. and then that's what they focus on though not the A you know which was art and that's what I that was happy about you know so it was a bit of a battle there as well you know take away your door, take away your car, you're not allowed, da, 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 you know. Um, and I, I think in that, I, I just, I had to overcome so many barriers in that sense to be like, no, this is what I want to do, you know. Did you, when was the point that you had to have that conversation? Obviously, you said you, I'm, I'm guessing you did like an artistic degree because that's you sort of alluded yeah. to it before. So yeah. before that point, and I even imagine like GCSE at A level, you probably have the discussion of, look, I want to take this seriously. And it yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. like we've alluded to your sister before, and I don't want to make out her to be the bad person because she smashed yeah. it in a different respect. But when you have like, a, when you have the stereotypical person, like kid who's succeeding in, in the stereotypical sort of academic route in education, it probably makes yeah. it a bit harder for you as well to be the creative kid. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I think that that's that's just um it's just, it's just because it wasn't the norm at the time you know mm -hmm. to 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 do that at such a young age as well and you know basically tell your parents no I want to be an artist mm -hmm. you know <laughs> because in their mind they're like what do you do like that's supposed to be a hobby a hobby or just do it for fun you know um and I was always like told why don't you work for an agency blah 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 after after uni um but before uni I had to really make you know stand my ground and be like no nah, I want to get into I, I was looking at like art colleges and you know art you know uh, creative universities and stuff which many of them declined me because I was so into my digital stuff by then mm -hmm. and um they were like we're not liking the digital stuff I was like but this is what I do <laughs> I can't change that um but luckily I got into uh, Birmingham University. So Birmingham City University was one of the, um, was my um, like clearance option. And I got into there, which I was quite um, fortunate to have. So a, a question that I had beforehand was like for, you're at school, you, you're liking art and you're doing drawings. And then mm -hmm. obviously this is probably around 20 years ago. So very early 2000s. Yeah. And technology isn't like what it is today. Mm -hmm the software options like everything like that probably were very limited to today so how did you get into digital that early on because surely like the even the like software and things would be like photoshop probably wasn't even around when you first started to get like messing out on computers and stuff or was it 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 was it was it just wasn't as advanced as it is now right okay uh, it was called back then it was called photoshop elements 8 and right. it was like this this like you could do like glow effects, you could do like shadow effects, really simple bog standard stuff, you know, like nothing, nothing like um, crazy, like AI stuff that you can do now. Mm -hmm. um, but back then it was like, um, it was so funny because at school, when I used to make all these little, um, you know, digital pieces and whatever, like portraits and, you know, edit people's photos and stuff, all my friends were like, hey, can you make me one? Can you make me one? And we used to call them productions at the time. <laughs> it's so cringy to think about now that we used to call it that and I used to just do it yeah cool why not yeah you, you know just put like a pink filter put a blue filter whatever and you know do up these people's photos and put their name there I think back then we used to have like websites like called Pixo and stuff like that Bebo you used to have yeah I was gonna say it was Bebo profile pictures <laughs> exactly and 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 I was that guy that was making people's custom photos for their Bebos and stuff like that you know that's the kind of stuff it was 
it was like these little graphics that people love to just have this personalized kind of little thing for themselves how so how have you progressed with technology have you just kept up to date with anything that comes out new because even now it's like probably within the past 10 years you've seen the biggest change um uh, and like in terms of uh software and even hardware to be fair like you've got I imagine that when you're doing digital illustrations now, you can probably use like one of the the pens on a tablet and and that's how uh, most people will probably draw now. I've literally got one here right now with me. So like I'm, I'm using it as a second screen right now, but it's, um, it's, this is more of a recent one that I got, but I like, I I, I was always wondering like, when am I going to be able to afford one, you know, um, because they were quite expensive and I was making a lot of money. Um, And it was, it was kind of like, do I get an iPad Pro? Do I get um, a separate tablet? But I felt like a separate tablet is what did me better. Um, it, even before even thinking about getting that, I had to afford a MacBook because, mm-hmm. you know, um, I'm very fortunate when I was uh, just before starting uni, my dad bought me my first um, iMac because that's when he started realizing that I'm getting into my, my, my graphic design and art and stuff. And he knew, okay, you know, the iMac is probably like the, the industry top tier kind of level thing that you need to do, you know, succeed. And so I was pretty, pretty lucky in that sense. But then after that, I, um, I mainly use that for music production now and I still have it. Um, but I, I, I managed to buy my own MacBook Pro and, um, you know, just get better in that sense because I knew I had something solid to work off as well. Do, do you have to like, stay on top of the technology side as well so like when updates are coming out and all that things like because if there's a new i don't know a new filter or something that comes on photoshop if you still use the, use that for example yeah. so like because in my mind like i think in a lot of people's mind when they think of an artist they don't really think of the tech savvy type of person oh, either yeah. do you yeah. know what i mean they think of the the person who's painting on a canvas or something but for yourself you'll probably have to keep up to date with all the new technology that's coming out because that could benefit your art going forward definitely it's it, it's always an updating process um because i if if you usually like phones these days if you don't update it it gets slow then it stops working you know <laughs> so much like photoshop and the whole adobe sort of um uh, system um if i don't update something something might stop working and i'm like okay that's going to give me a headache so yeah, yeah. Um, I have to stay on top of it. Um, but like you said, like people think, you know, being a digital artist might be an easy, easy, you know, sort of feat because you're using software, you're using tools that are already there. It's just they, they a lot of people don't tend to understand that it's how you use it and everything else that comes with it. I've dealt with so many issues in the past two years in particular with data and like my hard drive, the, where all my work is, you know, no. I've had hard, hard drive issues and lost my work and all these little things, you know, people don't see it happen because they think that it's impossible, you know, because they're not the ones that are doing it as well at the same time. So I've had to rebuild only like, you know, last year, September, um, I had to rebuild all my work and, you know, there were a few little glitches that happened, cost a lot of money, you know, okay, yeah, that... stolen, had to buy a new Mac. Oh, um, had a had a very bad setback um you know which um was quite not fun to deal with um you know car getting breaking into and um uh, someone stole all my work everything was gone in september and that was the kind of turning point the most recent transition point actually which now i'm pretty you know i i can say i'm i'm glad it happened mm-hmm. and i know that can sound weird to a lot of people like a learning experience yeah it's that and also somehow the world telling me that I was getting a bit too comfortable, you know, <sighs> being where I am. And I was like, okay, cool. Fair. It's happened. You move on. You know, I can't, I can't afford to st- stand still, you know, mm. because this is my, my livelihood. So from there, I was like, cool. I had a lot of work doing b- before September. And so I was pretty fortunate. I, I was able to um, afford an even better MacBook. And um, so my work is like just excelling now. So, yeah, it's just one of those things. And and th- th- those moments have kind of happened in different in different ways throughout the years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I get you. So like it's almost like a cyclical thing of like peak and then trough, peak, trough, yeah. peak, trough. But then yeah. holy, holy, just that that That's graph going upwards sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I-, I was gonna say the expensive part before, obviously, because like tech is just 
it's just disgustingly expensive. And like you said before, you have to keep on updating things. It's almost like, well, I'm pretty sure Apple got done for the previous iPhones. They made slower so that you're yeah. more inclined to buy the new one. And yeah. I imagine most other things operate the same way. Do you think when, like, say, uh, like a, a an update to the software that you're using happens, you find like a new tool? Do you think your style then shifts a new sort? Because you, you're naturally going to experiment with that new tool. Do you think like you may uh, might get like um, over abusive of that style if that makes sense? I don't, I don't I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say, but I think you get the gist. I get you. I get you. I mean, like, if there's something new that comes out, that I start using that, and then it it. And then your style for like a couple of months is basically just shitloads of them. You know what? I any update that comes out, I'm still kind of doing the same thing. Because mm. <laughs> because I, I know my process now. If anything, my process gets longer, and so there's more content for me to show my audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm not I'm not trying to pull out a, a, a new piece of artwork every every day or every two days. You know, um, if anything. I, I used to always be very quick to, you know, um, jump to the same process all the time, but now I'm just using the same process, just longing it out. And because I want to go more in depth, everything for me, I, I pride myself on depth and detail and more, you know, color vibrancy, because that's what immerses people into the artwork, you know? So, but it's, it's not that I, I take anything new and constantly use that. I'm still d- doing the same thing, using the pen tool, you know, creating portraits with layers. Literally all I need is a pen tool and layers. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> you know. well, how, how would you describe your style now? Because it is very, like, if you go into, like, say, your Instagram feed, for example, mm. you can see there's a, and I think this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about social media in a bit, but I feel like there is a, a clear progression. And at the moment, you have this very unique sort of, Vic yeah. style so yeah. how would you describe that so right now i'm in this this era of old traditional neon retro um style i guess yeah it's 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 very it's very um nostalgic i would say mm-hmm. you know because it's got these like these heavy neons like you know um i guess i'm trying to think like back in the day when it was kind of 70s 80s vibe um and you got all these old school songs but i'm i'm trying to bring in that that indian influence into it because that that, that's what i've always had and even then i've always stuck to the idea of maharani's and taking that idea and running with it in every direction you know that Mm -hmm. i can think possible uh putting them in all these scenarios and telling stories that's that's why I, i love doing storytelling you know um, now more than before. Before, I, I, don't, I didn't really see myself, you know, thinking, okay, I want to take a screenshot of someone's life and turn it into a story, you know, um, and let people's minds um, sort of just flow with it. Because me doing what I do now, people are able to somehow relate to it in some sort of way, you know, whether it's the, the the setting, the scene, whether they've been there somewhere in the past, you know, or it reminds them of like a moment or, or a feeling, you know, I think that's that's what connects to an audience, you know, really strongly. What sparked that change? Because before you said like you didn't really think about any of these things. Was there a like specific uh, piece that you did or a specific moment that you were thinking, oh, maybe I should try this instead? There's always been like a, 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 ground, a groundbreaking piece for me. Um, but right before, I believe right before all that stuff happened in September, I made a piece called Joy, Joy, Chupke, Chupke, which is this, uh, it's like this woman laying down on her bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, With the smoke and the rose. on fire. Yeah. And she's like, she's in half like a, um, a bride's outfit and stuff like that. And she's just chilling. There's, there's stretch marks being shown. It's very real. It's very raw. And the caption that I did to that piece was, was so... I guess, relative to so many females today that it blew up that piece, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and from then on, I realized that this is some, this is, this is kind of the di- direction that I want to start going in. Um, but I guess the aesthetic became more neonesque. That was very dark and behind closed doors type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole neonesque type of thing is just so visually pleasing for yeah, a lot yeah, of people yeah. to just see. And then when you look at the details within that piece, you see that it's very Indianesque and Desi. You know, people love it even more. 
because <laughs> yeah, people don't put the two together i yeah. think on the phone call that we had but like to set this up i think the uh, and I don't want to say this is a disrespectful way because I don't mean it in that way. But like it, I said, um, like a GTA loading screen set in India, exactly like, that. like Vice City style, like GTA Vice yeah. City, it's but an Indian version. Yeah. And I love Vice City and I love gaming. I think that's where that influence came into as well. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm 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 such a gaming dork as well. Sometimes when I'm when I'm even working on artwork, I'm either watching Netflix, binge watching or I have gameplay running in the background of like games and storylines and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Just because even, even during uni, I actually did a, one of my final major projects was um, in just designing a game, game concept, um, like researching next gen gaming, because I wanted to learn about, you know, um, how c- characters are created to look so realistic now, mm-hmm. um, how they do like motion capture, um, designing scenery, you know, so realistic and um, weapons and cars and vehicles and stuff like that. You know, so I went in depth with like a, a whole game idea. It doesn't exist real, but like I just came up with all the concept art and everything like that. What was it? You've got to, you've got to tell us. It was called, so, so, so the idea, it was called Duel, but it was based on like a movie where it's like a split personality type thing. So like the cop plays the, ro- play, plays the bad guy and the good guy. And he doesn't realize it so he's kind of in, in a, like a mental battle with himself type of thing that sounds it's, like a very it's, good it's, 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 it's to be fair, a, it sounds like a good movie it sounds like a yeah good movie. yeah yeah it sounds, but the thing is I like, like uh, now I, i've seen so many movies like that and so many programs that are like that as well and games that are like that mm-hmm. you know there's um that i think there's a i can't remember the, the game but there's one where literally it's um you are essentially battling yourself um and but you play as two characters yeah yeah it's like um, Jekyll and Hyde yeah yeah type of thing. yeah yeah that would be that would be quite dope I, I think I, I don't know if I've seen this on Twitter once before yeah I might be tripping but I swear down someone was trying to make like uh open map gameplay of like Punjab but like three four hundred years ago so like it, it, it would be like an Assassin's Creed type game right but right, you'd be right. playing like a like a Punjabi soldier from like I don't know how long ago. See now, the, 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 uh, an Assassin's Creed um, game actually did have Maharaja Ranjit Singh in it. Oh, did it? Yeah. Which one? Oh, what was it? No, uh, it was Maharaja Dalip Singh. Um, so he had him as a as a character, just like as a um, um, a secondary character that you just bump into in like a cutscene. Um, oh, but dope. when people saw that, they were like, "Yo, that's sick!" Because these game designers are realizing that their audience is so wide mm-hmm. around the world that they're going to, you know, if they put this into a game, more people are going to buy the game just to play it for that moment. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Because no, no, no. that, that clip when the first app on our plays it, they'll put it on their socials, it gets yeah, spread yeah. around, all that. And that's exactly but, what happened. Yeah, Assassin's Creed is really good for that, though, because they do, like, a lot of research. I, mm. I, I think there was, um, you know, the Egyptian uh, one that they had a few years ago, I think it might be called Odyssey or, or sure, something. Sure. Yeah. Um, apparently, like, the the pyramids and the tombs are that accurate that like the actual historians have basically checked it and yeah that's perfect yeah sort yeah. of thing which is it's, it's absolutely that, 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 i think that comes back down to te- technology you know like people are able to you know um go to these places scan everything mm-hmm. and recreate it to the t you yeah. know um and that's why the, these environments in these games that are so playable are so realistic and you know you feel like you're there now, th- this is where I feel like art is going to go in the future. Mm-hmm. I know I'm probably jumping guns again, but it, like, honestly, if I could ever in the future create a piece of artwork that someone can touch and walk into, like, you know, put themselves into, that would be game changer because this is where AI is going now. Like virtual reality art. Yeah, yeah. AI and VR is going in, in that direction where you can put yourself in a piece yeah. of art, you know. That would be very dope. That would be very dope. Um, style, you sort of mentioned that they're uh, Maharani's and things, and this is one of the topics that I want to touch on because yeah. I know you get a, a bit of um, backlash, shall we say, uh, about this. So it's a bit out there, to, mm. say, to say the least, especially for a South Asian community, which is quite traditional, reserved, <laughs> etc. cetera. Um, I, want to, I, I want to sort of like find out your point of view on it because all these people can comment whatever they want on social media. They'll see a snapshot and they might not like one aspect of a of a, a, a painting or a, a illustration that you do mm. but 
<laughs> from your perspective, is it um, is it like sexualizing women? Is it empowering them? Is it just showcasing what actual reality in in 2021 is? Is it a combination of all of them? Like when you're creating these pieces, that or is it actually like when you get a bit of backlash? And we all know that negativity does way better on social media for numbers. Is it another thing of let's just provoke people so I can grow more? Is it like what is going in your mind for when you're when you're doing the, them type of pieces? So I mean, I think it is a mixture of most of those. Right, um, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, it, but at the same time, it's just people's perception is so focused on the fact of sexualizing, you know, women, but. I'm more about trying to make people understand to appreciate a woman. And if I do, you know, now I do um, Indian erotic artwork on the side, just for, you know, just for fun. Like that's somewhere where I can put that. Um, it's for people to, appre to appreciate the body, you know. Um, I think mainly my, my, my focus and research of doing Maharani's was um, when when, when moving into the whole kind of Indian sort of style of my artwork, I was mainly looking at Mughal art, um, which is a very ancient style of Indian artwork, um, kind of like hieroglyphics, you know, stuff that was like drawn onto walls and stuff like that back in the day um, and on sheets of paper. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of the women that were depicted in these pieces were uh, either topless serving men um, and they were very sexualized. People just don't realize that there was a lot of, um, you know, um, one side in this. It was, it was like kind of, hey, worship men, worship men, worship men. There you go. And um, when, when looking at this, I was kind of like, okay, these, these kind of stories and scenes are being portrayed all around the place, you know, but I didn't, I didn't want, to, I, didn't, I didn't want that to exist now because that doesn't exist now. That shouldn't exist now anyway um even though in music videos this is the st still the same thing that happens you know you get you know these music videos that have so many provocative like images and you know women wearing near to nothing but um i i see maharani's as as queens and princesses that's how they sh they were portrayed back in the day and that's how they should be it's just that they were sexualized overly sexualized um and so i thought let's bring this into a new age and change people's perception on, on, you know, them and their mindset and how they must be feeling. Let's bring that emotion out. Um, and so when I, when I put Maharani's into these situations and these scenarios, I'm thinking, okay, let's think, let's think of the simplest thing, you know, eating a donut, I don't know, having a milkshake, enjoying ourselves. And this is a thing like from that, I can, I can write a whole story because back when I was, uh, at school doing English, poetry was one, one of my favorite subjects, you know, uh, sub subjects. And <clears throat> I think that's, that still shows in my captions now these days, you know, because I can look at something and I can write a whole paragraph, you know, or two and, yeah. um, you know, really dive deep into what this, what the subject of this piece is, and then let other people feel something from that. Now, when it, when it came to certain pieces that were a bit more um, controversial in terms of me portraying them in less clothes and, you know, um, wearing certain things, Instagram has taken certain artworks down and that caused a bit of an uproar because I have got a, a big female audience that supports the artwork. So that shows that, yes, they understand that I'm trying to empower females. You know, even even through showing the reality, the rawness of their life, their lives and the situations that they go through that often are just glorified in movies and, you know, um, on a day to day basis where they say, you know, you know, oh, you have to smile for this person. You have to do this. You have to do that so that this auntie doesn't say that or, you know, um, someone doesn't think that you're. Um, I don't want to say the words, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, that type of girl. Yeah. But this is this is where I, I'm trying to really show that men can understand females as well, you know, um, and what they go through or that at least we're trying to understand and, you know, relate to them and, and show that. I mean, especially for me as, as a straight guy, 
you know, understanding that females go through so many different, you know, aspects of life. And even um, a lot of artwork that I've done that is LGBTQ based, you know, yes, it expands me to that audience. It's not necessarily that I do it purposely to make that audience, you know, um, love my art or grow my following. Mm-hmm. I'm losing followers on a daily, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm losing hundreds of followers on a daily. But that's just what it is. That is social media. That just that comes with it. You know, you, you gain lose them. one audience, yeah. and then you lose another sort of thing. Yeah, and 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 that's how I tend to think about money as well. Even when it comes to you know artworks and commissions, money comes and goes on a daily. You know, I'm I, I'll never wake up the next day thinking that I'm going to get a certain commission or a job that is going to pay well, or it, I might end up making a loss. I don't know, but. I guess that's where my love for the unpredictability of life is, you know? So anything. The thing that you just mentioned there being obviously a straight male doing these, these artworks, do you think that is another reason perhaps why you might get as much backlash? Cause as, as like, um, I don't want to sound like a, a, a victim here in 2021 year, but mm-hmm. straight male seems to be like the, right. You, you're basically wrong in whatever you do. Like, I don't want to sound like the victim you yeah, person, yeah. but because if, if like, if it is for women's rights, then a, a woman who might be doing the same paintings might get a bit more appreciation of, oh, yeah, you, yeah. you're showcasing us a bit more, but because you're, like, technically an outsider, do you think it's more, you get perceived as maybe... I don't want to use... Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word. I guess I it's like... So, yeah. so, so, so someone could come to me and be like, yeah, but you've never experienced it. How would you know? Mm-hmm. and I'll be like nah I've got I've got a lot of female friends who are very close to me that tell me about these things tell me how they feel so that's me taking that in as an artist yes as inspiration but also trying to do something for them as well at the same time mm-hmm. not necessarily putting them out there you know like yes my friend could tell me this is what happened to her you know whoever it is and I could be like okay I understand and then portray that through an artistic manner that doesn't just out them, you know, but it gives people something to think, to, something to, to think about because perception is everything for me. It's like, I could put something out there that just means something like, you know, anything that is loving. I remember putting out a piece that was just for Valentine's day and this man giving a, it was like a Maharaja giving a Maharani a rose mm-hmm. and the amount of people that came at me they're like, this is incorrect. This is wrong. The man should be giving the, the rose to the woman, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wow, like, are people still thinking like this? You know, so things can get construed into it and twisted. But if anything, I'm getting people talking about it. Yeah. What well, another thing that you said, like, uh, at the beginning of this sort of section of the conversation was the the comparison to say, um, the, the history comparison. So like obviously now well, the reason I was saying like a modern woman because most of the things that you portray is basically what modern women do do you know what I mean like modern women will be on their their phones or going to the gym like I seen one of the ones which like was a weightlifting woman and things which is yeah um really cool and things and then back in the day they were topless and serving men mm. that is sort of an indication of what was actually happening then as well though because like if you look at Greeks and Italian artists from like way back in the day most of it is um nude but because most of the slaves let's just call it as it is yeah. most of the slaves that were serving the men weren't even provided clothing or whatever so it is actually like quite a quote-unquote accurate accurate representation of what was happening then but a more modern example that you just used was uh, music videos of sort of yeah. the oppression i guess you could call it um because it's it's just i'm really out of my depth in this conversation as you can probably tell because i'm trying to weird everything so correctly and it's like because it is quite a, a ropey topic but I get that, yeah. um h- how would you say that your representation of women is any different to say a music video of like a gangster rap type thing because a lot of people if they don't delve into the captions and mm. just see your instagram feed as it is and not read all of the poetry um below it and sort of what's in your mind may see them as quite similar sure yeah i mean like i feel like certain rap videos now are very different to how rap videos were back in the day though as well yeah. um 
just because I guess females weren't used in the same way in videos just to like, you know, be around the men. Um, again, though, that is what happens in these music videos, right? Like these days. And it's just like people watch it, but they're so they're so blind to what's actually happening in the music video and they're just listening to the lyrics which is i i personally feel like it's not the same as what it used to be back in the day mm -hmm. it never it's, it's not as real as what the stories were told back in the day you know like i grew up on like uh nwa and our you know run dmc and all that kind of stuff yeah and when you listen to their lyrics it's real you know like hard-hitting stuff that they've experienced and nowadays it's like i'm gonna mumble rap. It. it's it's literally mumble rap and it's one take one word and say it in a billion different ways you know and i'm just like it's 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 like poison to me man and i, and I can't do it and then with the music video there's no like storyline nothing makes sense because all they are doing is you know having themselves surrounded by drugs and women and dancing and stuff like that you know um i guess I guess some could say that in Punjabi music videos, it's more or less kind of similar because you got dancing, you got alcohol, you got, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff. But in some can say, you, some, some, some can say, it, I mean, <laughs> they're not, they're not some are. we're not saying that's, that, that's us, we're just saying some could say. Yeah, yeah, some could say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 just interesting to see, and I think I, I guess if someone saw my my page and saw that and kind of you know I guess thought that that was similar, fair that's on them you know that, that that's the way that they've chosen to see my page and see my art. But I feel like I would understand if they saw that on my OnlyFans because I have OnlyFans now. But um, I have that for like everybody. <laughs> I, there you go. Yeah, it's free. Um, <laughs> That's a plug. Uh, yeah, shameless plug. Um, but 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 the reason why I had to put that on a different place is because social media just didn't understand what I was trying to put out there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, artworks were getting taken down because I had this very uh, pr provocative-looking piece where a woman was a Maharani is wearing like a ball gag, and yes, that can initially, if someone saw that, they think, "What the hell." you know, like, that's not right. Like, you know, you're, you're sexualizing women. But then if they didn't choose to read the caption, they wouldn't understand the reason for it. And so it's always like, that piece is always about like, a woman being able to have her space breathe in control, you know, because it is a form of consent, that that piece of artwork, but it's, uh, it just, it, I, it just got taken down twice on Instagram. And it, does, it wouldn't stop me because I would probably put it back up again, knowing that it's going to get taken down. But that's me proving my point. I'm like, you know, this happens on, on Instagram without, you know, without anything getting done about it. Um, certain guidelines don't meet up. And so I felt the one place I can put up artwork like this is OnlyFans. And so that's why I did that. Is that where most of, like, as you said before, most of your uh, more erotic stuff is, is on your OnlyFans and then yeah. more of your quote-unquote yeah. PG stuff will be on? And, 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 and the thing is, even, even the OnlyFans, it's not like over-sexualizing women. It's, it's uh, body appreciation of women. So anyone who wants to enjoy that kind of artwork, and I'm sure there are, there are audiences that, that enjoy that, it's just classy. That's, that's what I'm trying to keep it at, classy. Not, um, not like, you know... Um, other types of artwork that is a bit more there's basically no faces no men in those pieces but it's all about you know um, females and different types of females yeah i get you I th yeah because I, I think that's the that is the weird thing about art which is the good thing about art is that everybody can see it and everyone will have an opinion uh if the artwork is good most people will have an opinion which is yeah. which is a good indication that you're doing something right because you are provoking an emotion it doesn't matter if that emotion is good or bad or or whatever but you're provoking an emotion which is the purpose of art and then to find out the the artist's intentions behind it i think that's where a few people will uh, that's where the discussion is basically because sure. then it's how people perceive it compared to the artist's uh, intentions going into it and how obviously everyone interprets something um, See, I always like even even before I even thought of doing that. I always had the battle 
first of like if I do that what are people going to think and mm -hmm. at the same time I was that's thinking, very that's very Indian of you yeah but the thing is like I've always been like this if I followed you know what people expected of me they're going to have a problem if mm -hmm. I if I still you know just did what was supposedly right or correct people would still find something to have a problem with you know and I always say this to, to people about like, you know, when their parents tell them no, or that, you know, if, if their friends disencourage them to do something, I'm like, if you, if, even if you were to do exactly what they wanted of you, or you didn't, they're still going to have a problem. In yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people, people find a way to have an issue with something, uh, especially if you're doing something good. So I was like, I stick to my guns. I was like, let me do it. You never know what could come of it. Whether I'm going to get backlash or not, I'm going to get backlash from, from some people and other people will love it, you know? And so I, I, fo I followed that, that instinct. And especially on socials, especially on mm. social media, where um, I, I obviously I don't know who's sending you these hate comments, but I can presume that uh, a vast majority of them probably are doing it off a backup account or something like that. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Like a yeah, faceless yeah, yeah. picture. Like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So like, <laughs> it's, very, it's very easy to be a big man and say, I disagree with your artwork and, and not have a face. Do you know what I mean? But sure. most people will not have sort of a conversation that i'm trying to have because uh i fall in the middle of like some pieces i'm like okay i can see what how that's sort of trying to be empowering women like the weightlifting one i'm like yeah that's cool she's an address she's weightlifting all of that stuff and then some of them uh yeah. for me are a bit more uh provocative in that sense so uh, and that's why i like having these discussion because as we said just before we started uh it's a learning experience i'm i'm gladly not always right and uh, uh it would be very boring if i was so um, <laughs> to have these conversations and to actually discuss them openly and allow people to have long form conversations not in mm. a specific character limit or anything and actually have conversations like this i think is important you know um, that, that's the thing like i guess just just very quickly i'm that's why now i've kind of moved away from doing sikhi artwork and hindu artwork and stuff like that because there was always people telling me oh this isn't correct this isn't right you know and when it comes to religion and artwork it's very easy to go wrong if you're if you don't do enough research and i feel like even if you do research everyone's you know um right to kind of like understand their religion in their way they could say that someone's wrong you know and yeah. so I, like i remember doing this this um sicky piece of artwork which had scripture and so many people came at me because they said the scripture shouldn't be like this, this is incorrect, you know? And I was like, I'm just gonna take it down just to be safe because mm -hmm. I can't go back and fix all these little things. Um, it, I could if I wanted to, but I felt like it was just gonna continue being like a, a downward spiral from there. Yeah, because even if you did, there'll probably be someone else who sees it a different way, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. like that's what religion is, and and everyone's beliefs in that religion is obviously it, it's a very individual thing but it it becomes almost hierarchical there's always sure. going to be somebody who wants to uh take the higher ground within that religion structure yeah. which is very ironic because that actually goes against most religions itself exactly um, exactly yeah but like because there was a few pieces that i i think i seen um that i i quite liked but they did get um a bit of backlash to being similar to what you were saying about the mogul type of artwork was i think the das guru but they were like as like hieroglyphs on a wall it looked very yeah, egyptian yeah, style yeah. In great masters yeah yeah and i think i seen a, a couple of comments on that saying like oh it's not really how we should be depicted or whatever and i was like yeah, yeah but you can like don't be arsy about any you can see what you're trying to do um yeah. and then i think the other one uh which i think got a, a bit more was um when you had the different gods from different religions holding hands yeah. um and and that was a that was a one that i think was uh got a bit of like religious comments as well of like uh, oh yeah 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 loads even on facebook like back in the day that this piece went viral mm -hmm. it's, it's not as viral now but i think it had its moment and you know it got shared around quite a lot um people had it as, as their pictures and profile pictures and people shared it on you know instagram and didn't know it was by me but that's fine by me you know I think because it does promote unity and that's the weird thing is when you try to promote unity there's some people who want to be divisive in that of like yeah, 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 yeah. why isn't this like this who's in the middle who's in the sides all that thing it's yeah like exactly that exactly that you know and, and th those were most of the comments that i did get about it because it's like you know certain things like where's 
where's um where's the islamic representation you know why is the guruji in the middle and i'm like no he's not he's off center you know and then there's other comments which is a comment one a common one was why you know because there's a heart that links each one together one of the two of the hands um there's three hearts um mm -hmm. there instead of one and people are like why are there three hearts and i'm like because I put them a bit too far apart. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Simple explanation. I'll be real about it as well, man. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna BS anyone, you know. But I think when it when it comes to art, like uh, people do look for little Easter eggs and do uh, obviously course. it's very attention to detail. It's yeah. a, a thing that I've said on on the podcast before when uh, of speaking to like other artists is my first like introduction to a lot of art was in besides the godwara and and obviously that's what we spoke about at the beginning of like the cultural side of things but at school i wasn't really one of the art like uh like in the art class but in history uh gcse history you we had to, an a level history there's a lot of cartoonism sure. you know what i mean to depict what happened in the world wars and things like that and i i always remember there's a guy called david low mm. uh, or or was uh, david low and he was the cartoonist basically put uh, in the uk I think he's actually from New Zealand or Australia, but he was in the UK during the time of the World Wars, right. um, mainly the second one, if not also the first. And he depicted all the cartoons of Churchill doing this, how done as like the bulldog and things and had Hitler and Stalin and all of these guys. And you can see the attention to detail and you, we got essays on basically his cartoons. Do you know what I mean? Like, what does this cartoon mean? Yeah. And then you'd have to do an essay because there's that much detail in it. You'd see something in the background, which would allude to something that is happening at the war at that time and things like that. And I think yeah. obviously Easter eggs have always been a part of art. And specifically mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, another uh, big up on artist is uh, Inquisitive. And he always yeah. says, like, look at the little details so you can find them. He's local down here as well. <laughs> oh, is he? Yeah, he's about 20 minutes down the road. <laughs> oh, fair play, fair play. Is is that something that you do as well? Because I see that you obviously, when you post your big picture as the, the main image on Instagram, for example, you'll go on to do um, like zoomed in pictures. Example. Yeah. So is that to basically highlight the little Easter eggs and the attention? Uh, to detail? You know what? No, 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 not so much the, the, the little Easter eggs. It's more so that people can just appreciate the details, the layering, you know, mm -hmm. because you, you, you'll see something on Instagram these days with digital art. It doesn't do it justice. And so I'm like, you need to look a little bit closer to see all the layers and the lines, you know, and the curvatures and everything like that. I think with with Ink's work, yes, there's so many, you know, little Easter eggs, which, um, you know, represent different things as well. Mm -hmm. And he's pointed them out in the past, which is pretty cool. You know, um, I think in some of my pieces, there will be little Easter eggs that I feel like people can, you know, sometimes miss. So, um, so yeah, we, we use the swipe feature to make sure people can, you know, catch those as well, or even see like the sketch beforehand or the, the time-lapse process, you know, which is pretty cool. Um, but just even on the, the, the religious factor, I, I would say also, um, I, I, I now just tend to not focus on so many, um, day-to-day -day issues, um, because in the past I've, if there, if there was like a tornado or, or a hurricane that happened or something and I'm doing an artwork for that, people just didn't like, you know, connect with it. They, they, they didn't uh, respond to it or engage with that post. You know, there's so many pieces that I've done that have um, tried to promote unity or peace. And those are my less performing, uh, my, my, my worst performing, um, you know, posts. Mm -hmm. And it just goes to show, I'm like, okay, people obviously want to ignore this or it's, it's it's the social media platform that's not pushing it out there because it's promoting peace mm -hmm. you know it's very it's very weird because and i don't think i don't think it specifically is that in my in my view obviously i'm no expert on like algorithms and things if i was my podcast would be doing a lot better yeah. but, <laughs> but i think what happens is is our natural inclination as human beings is to see things um to, to be more alert to provocative things if sure. you go back to like way back in the day if there's something we perceive as a threat mm. um we're going to be more alert to that it's very easy to be comfortable but if something's threatening us that's that's the one that gets the alarm bells ringing yeah, and when yeah. you see things that uh even even to some people things like equality is a threat mm. do you know what I mean so when they see posts that are 
empowering women or and like in the maharani ones yeah. and if it's if they feel threatened or insecure themselves that's an alarm bell ringing and because yeah. it's more controversial because it's more provocative the algorithm picks that up because people are going to naturally be engaging more because they're pissed sure. off yeah. whereas when people are saying peace and unity you're happy yeah but you don't you're because you're happy you don't give any attention to it like yeah. how often yeah. when you see a post do you say great post mate well done yeah, you, everyone thinks it. But nobody ever types it. No one ever if they says, started yeah. typing it, they'd see more positive shit. Yeah, but yeah. It, because it's always, oh, I fucking hate this, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Because they're posting, like, they're commenting, they're on the post for longer. Instagram just says, he's on this post for longer. He's on our app for longer, which yeah. means we need to show, show him more of this. Yeah. That's, that's how I see it, though. I feel, I feel like that's the... I, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. Like, it, it definitely depends on how people react to posts and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, I just felt like at the time, like it proved to me that I, I'm i not here to um, be like a news artist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like what's happening in the world today. Yeah. I'll still always share that stuff on my story. You know, I, I fully support any anything that's happening around the world and, you know, trying to, um, you know, use my platform to to show what's going on because people need to see it, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's just that I won't necessarily, if it's someone, I will always get people coming to me saying, oh, why don't you do artwork of the farmers protest? Why don't you do artwork for Afghanistan? I'm like, I'm not that, that type of artist. There's other artists that will do that. It doesn't mean that I don't support it, but um, I'm not going to do artwork of it because I don't feel like just because something is happening or same, same way, I feel like if some, some famous person passed away, I'm not going to do an artwork piece of them just because they passed away. You know, especially if I didn't know of them or, you know, why, why wouldn't I do, do a piece of them whilst they were alive? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's the age I'll say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why don't you appreciate them when you're like, how much do you do? It does pop culture. Like obviously we've, we've said the cultural sort of inspiration, how much does pop culture play a part? Cause as we said before that, the, the one where the, the girl smoking the rose, but like her iPhone's next to her as well. I mean, mm. that's a quite a modern thing. Like there's certain things I've seen. You've previously done um, people like Drake, Nipsey Hussle and, yeah. and Conor McGregor and Floyd yeah. Mayweather when that fight was happening. So how much does pop culture also play a role? I think it does. If, if, I, have, if I have an interest in it, I will. Um, and I think that the main reason why I did the Nipsey and the Kobe piece um, as Maharaja were, was because, actually not even just because they passed away, it's because I, I know I have so many close friends that um, that they saw them as idols and, you know, influences. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I wanted to do something for them, you know, um, to show appreciation in that sense. And I do listen to their music, you know, it's not like, um, you know, especially Nipsey and, you know, Kobe being such an iconic person. Um, you know, I, I wanted to just show that I understand and appreciate that culture as well. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I, I do, you know, and um, a, a lot of the, the hip hop portraits that I did in the past, those are all very much because I listened to that music and I enjoyed that, that era, that time, you know, these legends. And um, I was quite lucky in the sense that Ice Cube reposted that, the piece that I did of him, his, his, um, his uh, team got in touch with me and, and asked if they could, um, you know, repost it on his page. And I was like, hell yeah you know <laughs> of course are you not going to say no to that <laughs> yeah no of course and i think that was amazing um same thing happened with with um superwoman um obviously a, a youtuber that I, that I watch a lot and um around the just rain time and everything like that mm-hmm. and um yeah she, she she i can't you know if i could ever thank her in person i would but uh she, she reposted the, the piece that i did of her as well um as a maharani and um it, it blew up my page you know, yeah, and, I can imagine she's got some pull and, and nah. credit to her because at the moment she's one, she's smashing it, but um, uh, like she's she's highlighting issues that are obviously happening in our community, like the farmers' yeah. protests that were just yeah. sort of mentioned before as well. And and another icon who who not only reposted, but I think it was more of a collab, um, is the iconic, legendary Gurdas Man. Gurdas Man, yes. Yeah. <laughs> how did okay? How does that come about? And I, I imagine because. <laughs> You're of the era where he was king of the hill. Do you know what I mean? Like he is the top dog, and yeah. then eventually you get to do a collab with him. Was this was it a similar thing of you you posted the artwork and then his team got in touch, or was it their team oh, got in touch to create something? 
So um, Punjab 2000, which is a, a media company and, you know, that they, they cover, cover all these Bhangra events and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, they got in touch with me to basically ask me if I wanted to do a piece for him for his promo when he comes to the UK for his concerts. And I was like, yeah, bless, cool. Why not? You know, I just did it. And so um, I did that. And off the back of that, unexpectedly, his manager got in touch with me and said, we want you to, we want to commission you to do um, a set of artworks for uh, his show, like his his concert that's going to be happening in the UK. I was like, okay, cool. Yes. Like, I was a bit <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> but I don't think it really hit me until I sat there and saw what I had done on the big screen. You know, like I was at one of the concerts and the screens are huge at these concerts. And my artwork just appears and it's just nuts because one of the f- the first concert I didn't actually go to, I went to the one in Birmingham, but the one in the, in London, people saw it and they knew straight away without me even telling them. Like I was getting tagged left, right and centre. And this was one of those moments where I was just like, oh my God, is this actually even happening? You know, even when I was working on the pieces, I didn't think of it like that. Mm-hmm. I was working on the, these pieces of Gurdas Man, these custom, you know, artworks and people were like, you know, I mean, no, no one knew because I had to sign an NDA. You mm-hmm. know, I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't tell people I was doing this um, until it got shown at, uh, you know, at the show. Um, but th- this this goes back to me always thinking, I never woke up that day thinking that I'm going to get that opportunity. You know, mm-hmm. they could have gone to any artist, but I got that, you know, and that's probably one of the most proudest moments I can say that like, you know, as a commission, I, yes, I've done stuff for the BBC and even Naomi Campbell, that Naomi Campbell one was like minute compared to Gurdas Man. And I know that that sounds weird because it's just that I didn't do a portrait of Naomi Campbell. It was something else. It was something totally different for like one of her pop-up shops, cherry pop-up shops, still pretty cool got that opportunity as well you know and it's just it's just another one of those things like tomorrow I could get a job that you know I I couldn't even tell you that's the thing you know yeah yeah um anything could happen yeah exactly and so yeah that that Gurdas moment was was um amazing yeah and and even getting to meet him I got to meet him back oh literally that was my next question did you get to meet him what was his response did he give you any feedback on the art I guess because he actually didn't know like who I am, of course he wouldn't. But like, you know, I, I got the opportunity to go backstage, give him a portrait piece of artwork that I did for him and um, and try and speak the best Punjabi I could <laughs> and be like, I did this the, the artwork for your screens. And honestly, that it was like two much it was like two minutes, and it was it was the quickest, weirdest two minutes of my life because <laughs> he like got a picture and everything like that, you know, and I was like. I was like a little little kid and you know but he speaks to you with so much love mm. it was just it was amazing you know no that's sick that's it you, you always like want moments like that i've seen another one that you did was the musiala recently um yeah. and like them sort of moments of like because i think that he reposted like quite a bit of artwork from other people did you end up reposting yeah you, you know what this, this is actually a problem sometimes um because he reposted um my artwork but not through my page oh okay so through like a fan page or something like that that right, must have okay. reposted mine but didn't tag me mm-hmm. so someone sent me his story so the most story story and and said oh isn't this your artwork i was like yeah but i haven't gotten tagged in it i didn't know about it you know oh, <laughs> so, sure. um so at the same time it's a bit frustrating because he didn't know that it's by me or that he doesn't know who the artist is which sucks sometimes, you know, because then you're kind of losing out, you're, you're missing out on a, you know, a potential new audience kind of flooding in. Yeah. Um, but again, th- th- this is something that I'm trying to teach people um, about, look, if you're going to repost something, tag the person, tag the artist, tag the source, you know, which m- most people just don't do. Yeah, and no, honestly, like, I've had this conversation with basically most of the artists that I've spoken to, like so the, the ones that are big on social media as well. Is like, does it make it like how? Because that's a pet peeve of mine of like, just give mm. credit where credit's due. Like, I know, like, obviously, some places might not know the original source, and fair enough. But if you're doing it purposefully of like just not doing it, like, what's the point? There's, 
um, a, 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 an artist called Art by TDR. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah. So yeah. he did um, like a Banksy style sort of stencil on a wall of like in the farmer's protest and that went really big, but a lot of places weren't really posting him yeah. um, and like tagging him in it. And um, fortunately, like I really like honest that really spoke to me and that was the first artist that i got on the podcast because mm. i was like i want to speak to him because that's fucking cool sort of thing yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. it was a conversation that we had as well in that podcast of like what is the tagging crack and things but i think this sort of leads me on to the, the next sort of topic is is nfts because that's sort of something where it's like i can see why obviously they are a thing uh because like we just said sometimes artists don't get credit and um it, it's very easy nowadays just to take a screenshot and send it off to someone whereas obviously on them you can't but i think that some people might still not know fully what an nft is so could you explain what they are i know that you're doing some or have done some as well so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i've I, I i've i i've got nfts but none of them have sold so i wouldn't say i'm i'm like you know in the game yet until i sell <laughs> one <laughs> um but I'm, I'm definitely on the market so an nft nft stands for non-fungible token and so what that essentially is, is any piece of digital content, whether it be a piece of artwork, a photo of something, um, I don't know, like a piece of music or a GIF or something like that, um, that can be sold on the NFT space and authenticated digitally. So people can own that one piece of digital content. Um, it can be anything, a one of one um, or a collection of, you know, different things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's bought using a cryptocurrency called Ethereum. Um, and so at the moment, I'm, I'm, I, I have a lot of my artwork up as NFTs. Um, and essentially everything that happens with NFTs um, stays on a blockchain. So if people don't know, a blockchain is like a record of anything that happens, whether it's a price drop, a price you know, increase, uh, who owns that piece, you know, whether it's sold on or whether a change is made. It's like a it's literally like a, a digital footprint that just stays with that one piece of content throughout. So um, yeah, that, 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 that is essentially what it is. And, 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 and a lot of it is, um, it's still pretty new, but right now it's a weird time because people aren't buying stuff like what I'm doing, like full blown, full blown detail piece of artwork, but people are buying, spending millions on, these pixel portraits which is so aggravating for me because i'm like why are people buying pixel portraits yeah and a lot of celebrities like athletes and things are coming out with nfts as well and it's like yeah it's it, it's it's a weird thing so like because from this conversation I, I sort of like have found out that you're forward thinking technology wise do you think this is the future of art basically like. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I, you know what there's always been a bit been the, the thing of oh digital artists can't get into galleries because you know uh, i guess galleries always want fine art you know and what they portray as what what they you know subject as fine art is a painting or acrylic or watercolor and stuff like that but now there's this huge digital marketplace which is you know essentially a huge gallery where people can buy any of these digital pieces mm -hmm. these digital pieces can still be a watercolor piece or an acrylic piece that is just taken a photo of you know yeah. um it's just that i guess it's like i always use this example as well someone can can take easily take a google screenshot of the mona lisa and try and you know print it that doesn't mean it's right to do so or uh, the real piece you know mm -hmm. now if the mona lisa went up as an nft like the legit version by whoever currently owns it they can sell the right to that or the right of ownership to that to whoever wants to buy it you know could go for a billion plus who knows but um i guess that's that's where it's very you know a, a weird time because anything that goes up there, whether it's the weirdest animation or, you know, I know um, Elon Musk put something up and, you know, he, he made a song about NFTs. He made an NFT song and put it up as an NFT. Yeah. And, and people are like, what the hell is going on? You know, someone screenshotted the first ever tweet and put it up as an NF NFT and it sold, you know? Do you think do you think it's it's in a bubble at the moment because it is a very new thing and there are a lot of um, very influential people who are also wealthy so a lot of people say like take what they say as gospel mm. uh, 
for example, like NFT, like uh, not like NFT, like Elon Musk. Sorry, um, yeah, yeah, because yeah. like even with cryptocurrency, he was playing his whole little game, and, and as a mm. wealthy individual, he can do whatever he wants. But a lot of people take it as gospel, and it fucks up the market. Yeah, and it's like in a little bubble at the moment. Do you think that that mm-hmm. initial sort of buzz needs to settle down a bit and needs to sort of like cement itself as an actual thing? In a, and then maybe in a couple of years we can see a, a, its actual potential of is this a viable sort of thing for long term? I think I think it's already proven to be viable long term. Like mm. for, for for what's already happening, if it's that mad right now, it's only going to get better, you know. And and the thing is, yes, the focus is elsewhere at the moment, but yes, until that fizzles down a little bit, people start calming down and not in you know maybe the interest goes away from pixel portraits and, you know, these crypto punks and, you know, people that were early to the game. Other artists, younger artists will, will come forward a little bit more and their stuff will get seen like on Twitter. It's so, it's so just bombarded of just tweets of people just trying to sell their NFTs that nothing is getting noticed because it's just too overwhelming for people saying, Oh, Um, I feel like buying an NFT today. I've got one Ethereum to spend, you know, send me your, your recent, um, you know, NFTs. And I'm one of those people that are sending links, you know, (laughs) in the hopes that they'll see my, my my work. But um, I I think I'm in it for the long run. That's the thing. Like as I'm on the marketplace and I'm like, just like my Instagram growing over the past 10, 15 years, it's never a rush to get to that point. At some point, if a piece sells, it sells. That that will be amazing, you know. And and I feel like I know exactly what I do when it does, because yes, it holds a lot of value. Like what I've set my 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 pieces to on on the NFT marketplace is that. So when it sells, it upholds the value of something that I've you know put up. It, I, yeah. I don't want to ever under undervalue it, um, especially if I'm letting go of that piece entirely, you know, um, because again with what people understand with digital artwork, you can sell multiple versions of it, you know? Mm. Um, Where was that? It's just one of one. Yeah. So, so once, once an NFT sells, I will get rid of it on, on any, any other platform that I have, you know, so right. that that person owns that piece. That's this, you know, isn't there a thing where the, the artist can ha- still have a um, percentage of any further sales? I've heard of that yeah. as well. So it's, I think it's 10, 10% um, for every, um, sell that happens after that so even if if the next person has a secondary resale um i would get a commission for that so constantly that piece can keep on going for for years to come yeah and that would become a residual income if i was to you know um be be the first owner and if the yeah. price just keeps on going up someone buys it sells it to another person keeps on going up you just get kickbacks all the time which isn't too bad of it to be and i could see the little smile on your face so like yeah. i mean that, that, that's <laughs> the thing if, if that was to happen i i've always said that i would be able to do so much more for the south asian art community if i if i if something did sell because mm-hmm. i've always I, i've always got these plans and ideas for the future to um you know, set up these ex- exhibitions for younger artists because I know how, what a struggle it can be to, you know, um, to pay for exhibitions and, you know, set up um, um, printing, et cetera, you know, framing and, you know, um, even promoting, you know, these things. It, it's not easy, um, especially if you're an independent artist without any yeah. backing, you know. So I, I want to be able to provide that for, for a lot of artists in the future and even like a gallery or something like that. And I think that would be amazing, but I can, I feel like I can only do that if I can, I can do that quicker if I sold NFTs. Um, yeah. Cause it, even stuff like that obviously takes a lot of financial resources and you need, yeah. you need to do that as well. Perhaps yeah. even a virtual gallery in the future for people. Cause yeah. Yeah. if like NFTs and all that thing, uh, maybe you could put on like VR goggles and I don't know how that would work with payment and stuff, but that would be quite a cool thing in the future yeah. of like just sitting at home, put on some VR goggles and walk yeah. down and see walk all these through, yeah. and you and could they, just they, they, probably they, click they, on people's they, Instagram links below the paintings and things exactly. it, would be, it would be really 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 cool everyone's would, got a link tree underneath and stuff it'd be, it'd be awesome <laughs> that would be sick oh I need, I need to write that down and I patted it no, but, 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 I've just said it I'm like shit I keep that to myself but, but this is the thing <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it's innovative and, and that's the thing what people are seeing with NFT, NFTs and moving forward is like 
how, how I said earlier on about, you know, being able to walk into a piece of artwork. Imagine having something on your wall that you can immerse yourself into so much that you can smell it, touch things. You can, you know, um, walk through this environment that is, you know, semi-realistic, I guess, yeah. and comes to life. I think that would be the game change. That, that, that would be the moment where, where the whole world changes. Like, I've watched so much Black Mirror. I think I'm getting this <laughs> stuff from Black Mirror, man. Like, <laughs> it's crazy, man. I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror on Netflix. I've not, you know. I've seen, like, little snippets here and there with, like, weird shit, and I've just not yeah, watched it because of yeah. that. But th- there's this, um, not, I don't know if it's similar or not, to be honest, but um, there's a show on Netflix called Altered Carbon, which yeah, is yeah, quite yeah, futuristic yeah. as well and like some of the like things that go on in there like is i'm envisioning that when you're speaking basically like some something out of altered carbon yeah which yeah. is also a good show they yeah. they they're a bit too far because you can even reskin your your body if you want to exactly. you know? exactly. <laughs> which is nuts the yeah. um so i, I guess we'll, we'll round it off with because we've talked about the past and your journey we've talked about the future of art and things and i think at the moment we'll, tr- we'll, we'll round it off with the present is do you think that um at the moment social media is basically where it's like a marketplace for artists so for for yourself grow there show show your artwork and then you'll get dm for commissions and things um mm. for one-offs for people and then the next step above that would probably be any F- nft so that that's like a rare collectible but yeah. um do you think that like some places like instagram for example are and even TikTok now, like people are doing videos on TikTok of showing how they do the art pieces and they're getting commissions through there. I know that yeah. you do it yourself. So yeah. um, do you think that that's what social media is at the moment? Is it a good time for artists so that anybody can grow their profile and, and get commissions like that? I think, I think, I mean, at the moment that that's how, how I operate. Like I get emails or, com- or commissions through DMs, which is fine. And that's how I communicate with a lot of my audience because I can, I can be genuine. I can, you know, be, uh, I, I'm not too um, scary and unapproachable. I hope, you know, for a lot of people, I just <laughs> yeah. voice note people, man. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's so nice because they enjoy that. They, they're like, Oh, they never thought that they'd, you know, speak to me like that. And I'm like, well, I'm just a normal person, but you know, mm. I'm here on social media, just like anyone else. Um, I would say it's not the best place for artists at the moment just because I, it has been better in the past. Um, Instagram's changed so much. TikTok is definitely the best place for, to be for artists right now. I've recently joined TikTok and I've, for a long time I was against it because I felt like the following on TikTok is a lot more, uh, n- not as- There's um, a lower conversion rate. Yeah, and, and, and they're not necessarily there for the, for, for the content. They're, they're just, hitting follow because you can't hit follow very easily Mm -hmm. you know um i feel like that's not a a genuine as as genuine audience as instagram um because on instagram you get more engagement um but right now tiktok you're getting engagement of anyone you know it could just uh, they, they push your content more um, as long as it's good as long as so yeah, the yeah. the podcast before this one is uh, is t- um uh, a tiktoker basically oh. it's just called am am k bama and she's big on tiktok oh yeah yeah the- i know it. yeah yeah yeah. She's yeah, game. So, yeah 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 the game girl yeah, yeah so we talk about twitch and tiktok and we literally had this conversation in the last podcast of yeah. engagement and conversion rate and it is very lower on on tiktok but um and sometimes you can get carried away with the numbers because it'll look really big and then when you go oh shit but nobody's bought my artwork over here like yeah. my Twitch stream numbers, because Twitch is the complete opposite. Twitch yeah. numbers are notoriously low, whereas yeah. TikTok is notoriously high. So yeah, it is, it's and really then Instagram's in the middle a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that's why I think is Instagram's probably more accurate representation of like yeah. a, a conversion rate. Like people probably will be, uh, for me listening to the podcast, for yeah. you buying your artwork for here on her Twitch stream, for yeah. example. So 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 I mean like I, I guess. Instagram's always going to be my main plat- platform. It always is, and that that's where I've I've grown my, my stuff over over the years. You know, because mm-hmm. um, if anyone wanted to scroll down to like you know all the way to the bottom, they'll see that progression. Um, and and I feel like that that's kind of my my gallery in a sense more than my my website. You know, a lot doesn't come through my website. It's mainly through through Instagram, mm-hmm. um, and I accept that. You know, I'm I'm happy that. Either way, if people choose to engage through there, they engage anyway. Um, and I keep my story busy, you know. Um, but 
yeah, I, I think for newer artists, it's it's a it's a place to be, but also I don't think it's the best place to just think to go in with the mindset of oh, this is what's going to make me pop popular, you know. Uh, you have to do so many other things alongside Instagram to keep you know um, everything going at the same rate, which mm -hmm. is essentially what people need to do. Yeah, I think I think that's with most things at the moment, just because saturation. Like, if yeah. no matter what sort of thing you're in, it seems like every sort of possible industry is saturated on social media, especially Instagram. Um, and that's probably where TikTok is probably better, just because there's, I think there's still a lot of people who are still apprehensive of TikTok. Like you said, you were for a very long time. There's still, it's it's there's still perhaps I don't want to say stigma because that's probably too big of a word but do you know mm. what I mean it's, there's still like people shit on it basically like oh haha TikTok do you know what yeah. I mean whereas uh, and there's there's probably still more people using it than there are creators whereas everything else is probably more creators than there are people use like users so that uh, again I'm no I'm no media expert or anything it's just my what's in my head I don't think anyone is <laughs> yeah, I think exactly. everyone is still trying to figure it out man yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's always changing hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, so nobody is, not even them people who label themselves as Instagram influencers and could give you a fucking handout or whatever of yeah. a, a little booklet or a course. Fuck exactly. them off, yeah. yeah Mo nah, most cool. people can use common sense to get, uh, to, and that'll be like what they're basically in a, in a little handbook. Yeah. But that's a little I think a lot out. of people enjoy genuine content, not fake content. You know, people people call out on the fakeness so easily these days. Yeah, yeah. Because um, they know when people are acting and stuff like that in these you know, real situation gone wrong. You know, yeah. You know, um, when it's not. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. But I've uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Like, um, uh, we've touched on a lot of topics that, uh, well, throughout. To be fair, and a few that, as I say, I'm I wasn't very well educated on some of the topics, and you've educated me on some. So, uh, I really appreciate your time. What I like to do though, just before we wrap up, is the same five questions with every guest. It's in like a bit of a quick fire fashion and it's just a nice way to sum up the podcast. So um, number one is what are you most proud of? My tattoos. Are they your own artworks or did you get like... They are my own artworks, yeah. So Obviously any... you can't tattoo yourself. So do you just give your artwork to somebody else and then they do it? Yeah, so my, my, my tattoo artist is, in, is based in West London. His name's Davinda and um, he's done an amazing job. He's just caught all my artwork, man, like... I know I can't bring up my sleeves, but yeah, they go all the way up. I've got my granddad's name on my back as well, my grandma's name here. And so I'm always proud of my tattoos, man. They, 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 that's what represents me. That's my, um, you know, my, my proud you know, moment. That's my expression. What are you most looking forward to? Oh, God. Um... We've spoken a lot about the future during the podcast, so there's, there's got to be something. I mean, I mean, the thing is, I don't think too far in the future. So I guess my next doll gig. <laughs> Fair enough. How are they since obviously lockdowns ended? And They've been good, man. You know what? Yeah, it's 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 crazy because uh, I've put on a lot of weight because of wedding food in the past. And now I'm back on it, you know, <laughs> even though I'm trying to stay fit and go to gym and everything as well. But um, that balance, I'm still trying to find the balance, but I'm, I've definitely missed the dance floor, man. Like performing doll is is like another energy for me, man. I think everyone's trying to find that balance with their wedding food. <laughs> yeah. What what is your biggest motivation? Ah, uh, my biggest motivation is I always say illustrate for the future. So my biggest motivation would be making sure that generations in the future get to look back on like a legacy. That's that's my motivation essentially, like leaving the legacy. You know, um, moments like this where people can, you know, listen back and, you know, realize that something like this existed or someone said something that helped them in the future. That's nice. I've never thought about it like that. That's yeah, that's sick. That's sick. Um, what is your definition of success? Not money. Uh, <laughs> I would say, um, you know, genuine happiness or you know enjoying what you do on a daily um that 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 that's success to me because the thing is if i obviously if i ask anyone you know what they do day to day and they told me what they did because of the money that they're getting for it but they don't enjoy it i don't see that as success um i would say success is definitely like you know being happy going to you know doing what you're destined to do and being happy doing it 
-hmm. you know for me success is freedom I, i i get to wake up and work whenever i want and create whatever i want and then sleep <laughs> and then play all on the weekends yeah, and play all the weekends <laughs> exactly <laughs> and uh, last but not least because it's the culture cast podcast how do you think your culture has impacted your life thus far oh i think cu- culture is everything in in my artwork man and even my life just like culture in terms of like dol bangra the music that i listen to you know um the music that i make that i enjoy making um i guess even everything that has influenced my my art up to now and i think it even more has all be, been because of it, culture like i've always said culture with culture there's there's expression you know there's there's so much to be taken from it and understood and learned you know from loads of different cultures you know and now there's people are making their own as well and it's just like you know everything is a culture these days it's just what you get inspired by culture definitely inspires a lot of my my day to day you know mm-hmm. um just even like coffee culture i just I love coffee <laughs> that's my culture that's part of me man <laughs> you know <laughs> I, i've not heard the, the subcultures like that before but yeah 100% that's that's how i see it is like uh, uh, so the, the way i ask it is basically like at the beginning of of the culture being basically your background anything that is like for me uh, we are all like an amalgamation of our past and that's your yeah. culture like the experiences the interactions all of that stuff that's yeah. your culture and um, that's why i quite like in like ending on that and as we said before religion and culture are very separate things religion's a yeah. bit more controversial on things like if you talk about it and get things wrong so that's why it's a culture podcast and not too heavily related on anything on that side but again i've i've thoroughly enjoyed this i know obviously <laughs> uh, yeah, no, exactly. I know we've overrun a bit, but you've been gracious enough to to not uh, swear at me. So uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> um, Wait uh, till the recording stops. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. In two minutes. In two minutes, you will. No. But um, is the best place? I've got your link tree. Is that the best place for people to find you? Yeah, that's that's got everything there, man. My website, my my NFTs, um, Twitter, TikTok, everything everything so that will be in the link in the description with the listening on podcast platforms youtube wherever just click that link in the bio and um you'll be able to see all of vic's work that we've spoken about throughout this podcast so uh maybe you want to go and and check all the artworks that we've uh, referenced and uh see what we're talking about um yeah thank you again very much for your time vic yeah no worries man always a pleasure